I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode 51 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 051. We're going to jump right into the water on this one. I normally do not like rifles built around a theme, even if the theme is a coincidence or not. However, I did put this rig together as such because, well, it just happened to be what was available at the dealer. I really like this rifle, a Winchester Model 70 Coyote Light in 308, and I like this rifle, oh man, from the moment I picked it up. The lightweight nearly sold me on it, however, I was hesitant until I felt the trigger. When I started shooting, you could buy a rifle that, well, it didn't have a good trigger. It might have a passable trigger, but if you wanted a good trigger, you took the gun to a gunsmith and they worked it over. Later, you got the dropping kits that became available, and they could improve the trigger. But even then, the dropping kits were not, well, they just didn't give you the same kind of trigger you got from a gunsmith. Fast forward to uh, to modern times, and well, guess what? You go out, you buy a rifle, and you expect it to have a good trigger. Now, you can take that good trigger and that good rifle and be happy. We can take it to a gunsmith and buy a dropping kit, or you can take it to a gunsmith or buy a dropping kit. And then you have a better trigger, or in the case of your gunsmith, you probably have a great trigger. This particular rifle had a great trigger from the factory, actually. And that great trigger just happens to be Winchester's MOA trigger. It is a little heavy. I could go in, I could lighten it with the adjustment screw, but mm, in all honesty, that really wouldn't help. The reason I say it wouldn't help, for what I use the rifle for, the trigger is probably just about right. Now that I had the rifle, the Winchester Model 70 Coyote Light, I needed an optic for it because from the factory it doesn't have a scope. It doesn't have sights. You just get a rifle that's drilled and tapped for scope bases and that's it. So me and the dealer looked at his case where he had some optics and the only one that really stood out that would do what I wanted because I was really wanting a 3 to 9, you know, I really wanted a 3 to 9 power scope and I wanted a 40 to 50 millimeter bell the larger the better unfortunately the largest bell he had in the three to nine scope was a 40 millimeter bell and the scope was a nikon coyote special now that scope wasn't a matte finish so it kind of blended in with the receiver as far as the coloration at that point the rifle was put together i took it out zeroed it in and have been happy with it since and a lot of people that know this rifle refer to it as wily coyote simply because there's a theme going through the rifle. Now, the Winchester Model 70 Coyote Light features the MOA trigger, which is advertised as having zero take-up, zero creep, and zero over-travel. The stock is made so that the barrel is free-floated, and it, it's made with a composite material that greatly reduces the weight. Now, the stock is also vented in the end so as to help cool the barrel after firing, and it features a Packmire decelerator recoil pad. The barrel is a stainless steel fluted light varmint contour design with a matte finish. The receiver is also a matte finished forged steel design that, well, it has the recoil lug machined into the receiver as part of the design. The receiver is drilled and tapped for scope bases from the factory, and that's a good thing because there are no sights on this rifle. The bolt is a stainless steel jewel design that, well, it's basically a slightly improved pre-64 Model 70 short style action. Now the total package without the optic bases or rings weighs in about seven and a half pounds. With the optics, the base or the optic, the bases and the scope or the scope rings, I'm gonna say it weighs in just a hair over eight pounds. And it may weigh less than eight pounds in total. All I know is it's a very light rifle for what it does, and I really love my bolt action rifles. Now, there are more features about this rifle, but you know what? I'm not trying to sell you one. I'm just wanting to talk about it. Now, with that said, let me go ahead and run our audio clip for how to get the show. And after I get done with that, I'll be right back and we'll jump into listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website.
I've had a number of listeners send in questions about rumors they are hearing regarding Senate Bill 17 and House Bill 910. These rumors are false. However, because I have had, I'm going to say I've had probably about 15 people email me on these rumors, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to address them. Rumor number one, if licensed open carry passes you have and you have a concealed carry license from your state while your state has unlicensed open carry, then you can only conceal carry in Texas if your state has reciprocity with Texas. This rumor is false. The way the bill is written, there is no mention of how reciprocity is handled. And essentially what that means is reciprocity stays the same with the bill. It doesn't affect if the bill... Reciprocity really will not be affected by this bill. That's all I can say. Rumor number two is existing CHLs will not be allowed to open carry. They will have to surrender their license and wait 30 or 60 or 90 days before starting the process and getting a new license. That one is a load. Well, I can't really say that because I don't, I don't really want to go there. However, that rumor is just a rumor. I think it's actually one of those that somebody's trying to scare concealed handgun license holders just into thinking, well, we need to push for unlicensed open carry. And whoever started that rumor, you're not helping things. Let me just say that. And rumor number three kind of ties into rumor number one, where it says licensed open carry will destroy reciprocity. Oh, dear Lord. Really? Why would you even think that? And then we have number four. And this will be our last rumor we're going to address. Number four is a rumor that I think it's actually aimed to cause a lot of because a lot of people who are uninformed to get into a panic. And that rumor is basically that should licensed open carry pass, the only way anyone will be able to carry in Texas if SB 17 or HB 910 pass is openly. Guess what? It's not true. None of these rumors are true. I have heard a few other rumors, but they've been in such small quantity, like just one person asking it, and it's just a variation of one of those, that it's not worth addressing. There are other rumors like uh, open carry will cause blood in the streets or children will children will get guns and criminals will carry legally. And the truth of the matter is, no, none of that will happen. At least no more so than it does now. Well, I think it's time we move on and run the social media audio clip and I will be back shortly afterwards. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. While we may be getting social, uh, Jason Vialba passed a bill that's not very social to concealed handgun license holders. On March 10th, 2014, Jason Vialba, blah, 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 tongue-tied, Jason Vialba introduced a bill, House Bill number 2918, that is intended to protect police officers who are performing their duties. I will say that this bill is poorly written and could actually reduce protection that police officers get from third parties recording them. And that protection is a legal form of protection, not from armed protection. But first, let's take a quick look at Jason Vialba. He is a... I want to say he is a Republican. I don't see him. I don't see his party affiliation listed here. And he is serving his second term as representative for House District 114. And he first took office on January 8th of 2013. And he has a TSRA A rating. Now, he's on the surface. He's a pretty good guy. I don't think he's. I don't think he wrote this bill. And I really don't think he is. Uh, I don't think he's trying to infringe on anybody's rights any more than he has to. But I also want to say that, like many in our legislature, he is a friend to the police departments. The open carry anarchist, that would be those like Corey Watkins, don't like the police and they don't like anybody that supports the police. So they'll, they'll probably attack this guy continuously from now on. And the reason I mention Corey Watkins is because of what caused this bill to be filed. You can almost guarantee that this bill is filed in response to the cop watch and cop block activities from those like Corey Watkins. And I want to say that these cop watching cop block activities, if it's just somebody standing there recording and they're not in the way, that's perfectly fine. 
However, the shouting, the yelling, the use of slurs towards officers while they're doing their job, that doesn't help. And the open carry variation of these efforts while doing the shouting, the yelling, and the using of slurs, those do not make officers feel safe at all. In fact, just the opposite. Now, we've mentioned this bill being a response to that. And the reason I say it's a response to that, and specifically Corey Watkins and his bunch, Jason Vialba, is from Dallas County. That's where his district is. Now, for those of you who don't know, Corey Watkins leads Open Ter- Carry Tarrant County. Tarrant County is right next door to Dallas County. It's right there in that area. And what you have to keep in mind is all these police departments around Arlington are nervous about CJ, not CJ, but uh, about Corey Watkins. I mean, you have a guy that he doesn't seem to be in his right mind when he posts some of his YouTube videos. And he's organizing these open carry cop watch activities. I would be nervous if this guy was in the room with me. If he was in the room with me and had a weapon, I would probably leave the room. I would probably leave the building. And on that note, I do not blame anybody for being nervous about the activities of those parties that are like that. Now, with that said, this bill is not the way to go about it, not in its current form. And, the, and to explain why that's the case, we need to look at this bill and we need to look at what it does to Section 3815 of the Texas Penal Code. Now, 3815 is the interfering with the duties of a public official. The first thing the bill does is it capitalizes the word emergency in the definition section. That seems to me to be kind of a, you know, we're going to do this, but we're going to, we're going to throw in this little bit of a grammar police activity too. And then it defines the news media. And it defines them as a radio or television station that holds a license issued by the Federal Communications Commission. In other words, you have to be rich to get that. We're part of a corporation. So, you know, you're really limiting a lot of people. But they don't really want to limit it too much or it might be a violation of the First Amendment. So they're going to open it up to newspapers too. And a newspaper is defined as a newspaper that is qualified under Section 2000. 51.044 51.044 government code to publish legal notices or is a free newspaper of general circulation and that is published at least once a week and available and of interest to the general public in connection with the dissemination of news or public affairs. That sounds pretty fair. And there's a third defini- or there's a third group that is defined as media and that would be a magazine that appears at a regular interval that contains stories, articles, and essays by various writers, and that is available and of interest to the general public in connection with the dissemination of news or public affairs. This is a carve-out for Texas Monthly. Now the bill creates Section F, which does the following. For the purposes of subsection A1, an interruption, disruption, impediment, or interference that occurs while a peace officer is performing a duty exercising authority imposed or granted by law includes a person, one, filming, photographing, or documenting the officer within 25 feet, or filming, recording, photographing, or documenting the officer within 100 feet of the officer while carrying a handgun under the authority of subchapter H, chapter 411, government code, which is, at the time of the recording of this podcast, a concealed handgun license. If everything goes according to plan, that will be a license to carry a handgun. The bill also creates Section G, which does the following. Creates a defense to prosecution for an offense under Section A1 based on conduct described by subsection F2 that the interruption, disruption, impediment, or interference was caused by a person who at the time of the offense was a news media employee acting in the course and scope of the person's employment or employed by or working with an organization or entity engaged in law enforcement activities. This is a carve-out so that TV shows like cops can have officers with the police and so that any of the three groups of media can have involvement. Now, we're going to have to go back further. We're going to have to go backwards in the bill to get to the penalty section, which adds a Class A misdemeanor for an offense where a CH holder is, CHL holder is recording, photographing, or documenting an officer within 100 feet. Basically, the whole thing's a Class B misdemeanor unless you have a concealed handgun license, and it's a Class A misdemeanor. Now, let's talk about what this bill does with the law. It makes it illegal for a party to record their own interaction with officers 
as the officer cannot interact with them if they continually move 25 to 100 feet away in order to be able to record it. Essentially, this bill makes it illegal to record your own traffic stop. And we'll come back to that because that's an important thing to consider here. This bill also makes it illegal for anyone to record officers within 25 feet. That is not good if the officer needs, you know, let's say the officer might need the recording. Let's say there's some debate as to what happened. Let's say the arrestee says he was using racial slurs and that disorderly conduct led me to hit him. And the officer says, I was not using racial slurs. And when he hit me, I took out my nightstick, I clubbed him upside the head, and he quit hitting me. Now, an officer's recording may get muffled, or if the guy is struggling before he hits him, the, the microphone may be focused on the sound of the struggle, which will be possibly right there where the suspect's hand's on top of the microphone. If that's the case, an officer might really benefit if somebody is recording, say, 10 feet away with audio on their video recorder, or maybe they're just audio recording. An officer would benefit in that case from having somebody closer than 25 feet. The further away you are, the less clear the audio becomes. And the bill does make it illegal for those who are not part of the media to record within 100 feet of a police officer while armed as a CHL. I don't know why they're targeting the CHL here. I mean, it's understood that some of Corey Watkins' little uh, band of miscreants may have a CHL. But the CHL does not let them carry their black powder guns. It does not let them carry their long guns. They're doing that without it. And it's perfectly legal that they do it. And if the officers are truly worried about these armed parties carrying firearms while doing these cop watch and cop block activities, the bill needs to be rewritten to accommodate all of this. And then the bill might stand a better chance of being passed. And what this bill does, does and does not do in reality is that it does not protect officers from the open carry cop block activists. I mean, let's face it. You want to send the concealed handgun license holders, the most law-abiding group of people we can document in the state of Texas, 100 feet away. Meanwhile, you got people like Corey Watkins and his little merry band of miscreants openly carrying long guns and black powder revolvers, and they're right there, 25 feet away, and I'm not going to go into the details, but there's been a lot of people post various offenses that they feel that Corey Watkins has committed, and these things come from some sort of a record that they have access to. I don't know how true those are. I'm not going to go into it, but in all honesty, I don't know if Corey Watkins and his merry little band of miscreants would be amused or if they would be more active as a result of this law, but it's not going to stop them. It's not going to move them more than 25 away from the activity. It also makes, this bill makes it illegal for anyone to record officers within 25 feet, including someone who has been stopped by the police. Oh man, I went back and I was looking at my outline and I was reading the wrong thing. But anyways, let's go back to it. This bill does remove the potential source of evidence in an arrest or in the event of an accusation against an officer. And this is critical. You really do need that information if something happens. If the officer gets attacked, and his weapon taken, because everybody knows officers open carry, and everybody knows if you open carry, your gun's going to get taken away from you and used against you, because the anti-gunners have told us so. But let's say the officer is involved in a struggle, and he's shot, whether it's his own gun or the suspect's gun. His video recording system may not have a good image of the suspect, but somebody there may have a good image that could lead to the capture of the suspect. And you're going to remove... You're going to reduce the usability of that evidence by moving people further and further and further and further away. So let's consider what we can do to improve this bill. What this bill needs at a minimum would be a provision for someone who is stopped or detained by the officers to record their own encounter. This would be required in order for this bill to even remotely consider passing a constitutional uh, test. This bill could give an, give an officer the authority to require people recording, photographing, or documenting to move people back no more than 25 feet if they feel it is required for the following. Their safety, the safety of the person recording, the safety of a third party. That's right. Those may sound uh, similar to something about disarming a concealed handgun license holder. And that's because, well, that's what it's based off of. Now, in addition to the 25 feet rule, I think the bill could be written and it would be acceptable to move people back 25 feet 
or 10 feet beyond the road for their safety, whichever is greater. In other words, if somebody's standing on the other side of the road and they're right up on the edge of it and there's not much of a shoulder and they're getting as close as they can, they're likely to get run over. Moving them back another 10 feet would be a good thing. And I can see that. And then you have, a, you need a provision so that an officer can disarm or require people recording, photographing, or documenting while armed to move back 100 feet if they feel it is necessary for the following, their safety, the safety of the person recording, photographing, or documenting the incident, or the safety of a third party. And a person would be considered armed if they were carrying openly or concealed one of the following, a firearm as defined in section 46 of the Penal Code, a pre-1899 firearm as defined in section 46 of the Penal Code, or a black powder replica of a pre-1899 firearm. In other words, this would be designed specifically to target anyone carrying a weapon that was recording, but the officer would need to feel that it was necessary for their safety to do so. This addresses a number of issues because it allows the officer not to move people, or it lets people closer as long as the officer does not decide he needs them moved back. And I know some people say, well, you just, you just get over there being all cuddly with the cops. No, actually, no. I think this is the best compromise that would give everybody what they need for the bill. I mean, a lot of my friends are police officers or sheriff's deputies. And in all honesty, these people have a job to do. They would be uncomfortable if somebody that's recording a trip pulls over, say, 25 or 100 feet away from where they have a stop in order to turn off a camera while they're doing their stop, and then they simply turn the camera off and then start moving again. That's going to make that officer very uncomfortable. Why? Because anytime somebody stops some distance away from where you are and you're on the side of the road, you're wondering, what are they going to do? You know, if you're a police officer and you're dealing with an area where somebody might think you're the enemy and they might simply decide to do something that doesn't need to be done to you, then you run the risk of somebody pulling over having bad intentions. And I'm, I'm going to say that I would like for my friends to be safe. I have no problem saying that. But I would like to say that I don't want my rights infringed any more than necessary. I don't want your rights infringed any more than necessary. The best compromise is to allow them to move you back if they feel it's necessary for someone's safety. That will, I'm certain that would pass muster in court. But you know what? Let's move on. Let's talk about a legislative update because we've had some movement on the bill since the last episode. First off, Senate Bill 17. It passed Senate approval, and let's discuss what that means. That means the bill has been engrossed by the Senate, and it now goes to the House. The bill did have some amendments added, and there are three of them. We're going to cover them real quick. First off, the effective date is now January 1st, 2016, instead of September 1st of 2015. This is to give the DPS time to update their training and get new training to the concealed handgun license holders. Another amendment prevents open campus carry, meaning that campus carry would have to be concealed. Some people are saying, well, that's a violation of my rights. And I think that really, in all honesty, it doesn't really matter if you're going to carry openly or concealed on a campus, but if you want to get the bell passed and you want to get campus carry passed, got to have that amendment. Otherwise, you won't get enough votes to pass it. And the third amendment that the bill has adds open carry instruction to the initial class portion. Overall, these three amendments were pretty much needed to get the bill passed. And then we have Senate Bill 11. It's, been, it's got its Senate approval, and that means basically the bill has been engrossed by the Senate. It now goes to the House, and it too has some amendments. There was a committee substitute that added a provision to prohibit open campus carry. There's a provision to protect private and, and independent campuses' ability to ban carry completely, not just on the premises. And there's a provision adding private and, in, and independent campuses who have opted out to the Texas Penal Code Section 46035, which is where it's illegal to carry on a campus as it stands. And there's a provision expanding prohibition on open carry to, uh, <clears throat> well, I'm sorry, there's a provision expanding prohibition on open carry on campus, meaning it makes it illegal to open carry, I think, on the entire campus. I'm not 100% sure about that. It's been a few days since I looked into that. And then there's Senate Bill 273, which has Senate approval, and that means it's been engrossed by the Senate. It now goes to the House. 
There are no amendments added outside of the committee, but there was a committee substitute that did refine the bill slightly. And with that said, we're going to move on. We're going to hit the news after I run the political or the political good grief after I run the contact audio clip and I'll be right back. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. An annual event in Austin, Texas, known as South by Southwest, was the scene where the open carry group, come and take it, took their march to draw attention to the, well, to open carry and acclimate the public to it. There was some panic caused by this simply in the media. No one actually at the event showed any signs of panic, though. Why does the media panic at open carry? I don't know. And our next news story, I'm just going to go through these. I'm kind of distracted right now. Our next news story is the 3D printing of a handgun for personal use is something that anyone can do legally if they can legally own a firearm. The 3D printing of a suppressor, or also known as a silencer, now that can uh, land you in prison unless you have the special federal firearms license that allows you to manufacture those suppressors. But still, it's something that anyone with a 3D printer can do, as, dis- as it was demonstrated by West Fork Armory in Conroe, Texas. Now, I understand that Conroe, Texas got the special operations tax stamp to be able to do that. I'm not entirely sure about how that all is done, but from what I understand, that was all done legal. Our friend Michael from the Come and Take It podcast shared a news article on the long rifle in Texas Monthly. One particular rifle mentioned in the article is one of the few surviving firearms used by the defenders of the Alamo. Now, this rifle is a Jacob Dickert long rifle made in Pennsylvania and is among the weapons that defenders like Davy Crockett would have brought with him. It is unknown who brought this rifle with them, but it was, it's been documented that, yes, it did come through the Alamo. That weapon is on display at the Alamo, and it's appropriately referred to as the Dickert rifle. And with that said, I am going to uh, hit the sign-off music, but first, I do have to say, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.